I'm here today to talk a little bit about innovation in manufacturing. I'm going to take this in a little bit different direction, but tying it back to our mission as well and say why innovation is so important to what we do within the Advanced Manufacturing Office. And that's an example of what you all do every day across the Department of Energy in driving forward these advances we have in advanced science and technology and connecting them to our mission so we have impact on, on, on society around us and, and the nation that's, that, that we serve. So start off by talking about what do I mean by manufacturing innovation. There's two major elements of it. One is the part that often people go to, which is the technology innovation. The how do you discover new knowledge about science and technology out there so we can solve something that nobody's ever solved before. How do we do that research and development that's really the cutting edge, over the horizon kind of work so that then those technology solutions are available. But just as important, it's connecting that technology innovation and that technology discovery with people. Giving people knowledge, and that's part of the dissemination of what we wind up doing, so that as they go out and implement these technology innovations and the technology advances out in the marketplace, they now have a new set of skills, a new set of capabilities, and their organizations have that understanding to say, here's how this technology can take us in a new direction. That's never more important than in the manufacturing sector. Almost two-thirds of all patents are related to manufacturing. Almost three-quarters of all research and development that is done in the United States is done related to manufacturing. So connecting those things together and making sure we have innovation going into manufacturing is important. Now the good thing is innovation is in the DNA of everybody in the United States. If there is one competitive strength that I will always rely on for our country, that's the ability to innovate. Whenever faced with a challenge, we innovate. Now David showed this a little earlier. This is out of the Innovation uh, Revolution Now report. But you're looking at uh, the price of new products and uptake of new products in the energy sector. The important thing to note here is in no case were we inventing a new product. These are actually manufacturing innovations. It's not like someone just went out and suddenly in 2010 invented the solar cell. That was done back in the 1960s. We invented all those other things you need to be able to do manufacturing, getting manufacturing uh, cost competitive. And once it's cost competitive, the market's a wonderful thing. It will wind up taking off. But getting down that innovation learning curve is what we work on. And this ties back, as I said, to that Revolution Now report. So with that, I thought, let's dig into the history of some revolutions in the United States. Oop. So let's go back to our original revolution. So Lexington and Concord, April 1775. Almost the same month, but in 1775, James Watt and his business partner, Matthew Bolton, incorporated their first company. This was the start of both the US Revolution, the American Revolution, and the Industrial Revolution, exactly the same time they wound up starting. It's important to note, note, Watt didn't actually invent the steam engine. That had been done 50 years earlier by a guy named Newcomen. What he invented was the steam regulator that allowed you to get useful power out of it and get economic use out of the steam engine. It's a huge advance that wound up happening. So these two revolutions are going on at the same time, and we're standing up a new country. We had our first Treasury Secretary, Alexander Hamilton. And when he met with Congress, they asked him to do, look into three things. One is, should we issue currency? Second is, how do we pay off the debt from having the revolution we just ended? We just won. And then the third is, how do we deal with this new thing called manufacturing? So I think a couple of things to note here. First of all, for those of you in the audience, we have been doing reports to Congress for 225 years together. So that's not new. I wonder if they had the concurrence process at the same time to get through, uh, get through OMB. Uh, OMB probably predates it. Uh, but uh, you know what's interesting is what the observations he had. First of all, is encouraging manufacturing isn't just important. Remember, you had the, the northern part of the U.S. had a lot of manufacturing centers, and in the south, you had more agricultural areas in the southern, southern colonies and states. But he said encouraging manufacturing is actually important for all parts of the Union. It was, there was a lot of divide that they were bringing back together. 
but it was important to support manufacturing because not only our wealth, but both the independence and security of the country was dependent on this and would become increasingly dependent on this. And because of this, I said, you know, it's in, for support of the economy and in developing an eventual and per permanent economy to encourage the growth of manufacturing. So this has been national policy for 225 years to be able to go forward in this direction. What that first industrial revolution gave us were things across the country. On the left, you actually have the town of Findlay, Ohio, that was completely lit by what they called town gas in the mid-19th century. If you notice on there, there's a sign where they're celebrating 31 new factories that were locating in the area in one year. So the Chamber of Commerce was there in, in, in the uh, 1850s. You have the DuPont plant up in, up in Wilmington, Delaware area, was early industrialization. You also had the rise of cities that wound up happening, and that's the picture over on the right, looking at New York City. And with that city, you had crowding. You also had, for transportation, you had horses, and they had the great manure crisis of 1894 that was looking at how do you deal with all the horses in your cities, and how's the solutions? This drove another round of innovation. You wound up having to, to deal with lighting and make it more broadly applied, you had electrification. So you actually had Edison and Westinghouse coming together in the Chicago's World, World's Fair. And this picture is the first time you had large-scale lighting of an urban area. You had scaling up of manufacturing facilities from, from the first mills up at the, up at the top down to, in the Pittsburgh area, the Duquesne factory, and at the bottom there, Youngstown, Ohio, with steel. And the broad scaling, of, especially of those energy-intensive processes. And importantly, you had standardization in the assembly line. The automobile was not invented by Henry Ford. What Henry Ford innovated on was manufacturing. It was saying, how do I make a car cheaper than a horse? And by the way, they solved a major problem of the great manure crisis by doing that. What's interesting is a lot of those technologies that were developed, you could take an engineer from 1900 and bring them to today to a modern manufacturing facility. And in many cases, superficially, they'd say, yeah, I understand that process. I see where that goes, where you have steel making, you have chemicals, you have concrete, glass manufacturing, and you have assembly lines. Those things still exist. By the way, these are the areas our office winds up working in. Almost a third of all energy is related to either the production of electricity going into manufacturing or directly in manufacturing. So addressing these problems, is important to both our energy mission and our manufacturing innovation mission. But what's new? We're at a real inflection point, a third industrial revolution we're going through. We've got the rise of Moore's Law, so you wind up having cheap computation. That winds up leading to things like the supercomputers that the Department of Energy winds up managing. You're having an interconnectivity that's never before been thought about. Think about it this way. Facebook is only a decade old. When you reflect on that, say, what over the next decades are going to come forward in terms of communications technology? And how do you wind up taking that communications technology, that computational technology, and the actuation technology that you wind up having in robotics, and connecting those things together and use them in manufacturing? That's what our challenge is in technology right now, making sure we can take advantage of this third industrial revolution so that we're moving forward in the energy sector with all of these areas. So we wound up working together with a number of offices through the quadrennial technology review process and then took that into the advanced manufacturing office in our own multi-year program plan and identified these 16 cross-cutting technology areas where we can wind up investing. And the broad categories are development of materials, development of processes. But the thing that's new is how are we using information and information technology, sensors, controls, communication, so that we can wind up producing more effectively in our manufacturing sector. And by the way, in doing that, you wind up reducing the amount of energy that's lost in manufacturing. What happens to the jobs is the question I always get. There's this fear out there. It says, what happens if a robot takes my job? What's going to happen to the economy? Interesting you look at, 
Over on the far right is actually manufacturing overall. For every job in the manufacturing sector, there's 0.8 jobs created outside the manufacturing that directly support that job. I'm not talking about the multiplier effect where people go home and take their paycheck and then they you know, buy groceries and go to restaurants and all that stuff. I'm saying directly in accomplishing their job in manufacturing, manufacturing overall creates 0.8 jobs outside the manufacturing sector. Logistics, sales, corporate functions, all that sort of effort. What's interesting, if you look at advanced industries, and these are industries where you use science and technology innovation, you wind up having 2.4 jobs outside the manufacturing sector for every job in the manufacturing sector. So at its peak, the manufacturing sector was up to 19 million jobs in 1979. We fell to about 11.5 million jobs in 2009. We're up to about 12.5 million jobs right now. We actually have a growing employment base in the manufacturing sector. But what's interesting is the jobs that are coming back are those technology-enabled jobs. I will point out the one sector that actually exceeds the advanced manufacturing sector is the energy sector overall. It's a huge motivation for what we wind up doing. It means that everyone that winds up taking the technologies that are developed by us and using them out in the private sector actually become the foundation for the economy for their friends and neighbors in their communities. This is a huge benefit of what we do every day. And these are good jobs. If you look at advanced manufacturing sectors relative to all sectors, across the board, from PhDs to people with absolutely very little education, if you're in an advanced industry sector versus a non-advanced technology-enabled industry sector, you have a higher pay, pay on an annual basis. Again, an important thing, especially considering the current national debate about what are we doing about jobs. This is a key to where our technology innovations can wind up having impact on this. As I said, if there's one thing I will bet on, it's the U.S.'s ability to innovate. If you look across the board with developed countries, the United States is second only to Norway, and I would say we have a much larger population than Norway. Um, well, I'm Norwegian, and as you can tell, I'm tall, so it's not larger, but it's not taller, but it's larger in terms of total number of people. Sorry, bad joke. Um, but the most productive workers in the world, bar none, are the U.S. manufacturers, as far as the amount of GDP per worker we wind up having. And this is actually borne out in terms of what's the state of the current manufacturing sector. This is actually through the Federal Reserve, a, a statistic they wind up using called real economic output from the manufacturing sector. It's indexed to $2,009. We're at about $2 trillion of the economy is in the manufacturing sector right now, and it has never been higher. So the manufacturing sector is doing well. Are there other sectors that are growing as well? Yes, of course. It's because they live on that foundation of manufacturing that winds up driving the entire economy. This is being recognized just as in Alexander Hamilton's day across the entire country, where this is just a snapshot of communities that are developing their own advanced manufacturing strategies in their communities. And as you can see, manufacturing has and continues to be important to all parts of the nation. So if we're successful, we wind up doing that by linking advanced manufacturing and energy and using innovation. It's good for national security. <coughs> using energy independence and the stable, diverse supply of energy resources we have to make the things we use is an important element of our security. It's important to the economy. We can competitively manufacture products here and sell them to the world. That winds up resulting in domestic jobs. And at the same time, we're then responsible stewards of the environment around us, clean air and clean water. So what does success look like? We're not just inventing technologies here, but we're producing them competitively here and manufacturing them here. So with that, thank you very much.